Elio, could you check the uh, YouTube? Okay, no, it's not the screen. But Are we all good on uh, the streaming? Okay, cool. All right, that's about time. Um, welcome back to the end of week five. Um, so last um, week we started a discussion on uh, unit testing, so test-driven development, and also on uh, on recursion. And uh, today we are going back a little bit to those uh, units. Uh, as we haven't had the opportunity to do the lab coding associated with those. And we will start also the lecture on uh, collections. This is quite a big topic uh, with large uh, coding sessions as well. So it will be split um, into lectures. So starting today, and ideally we'll manage to go through all of it um, on Monday. Um, admin staff, um, assignment one is currently being marked um, and the feedback will be provided directly in your repositories. Um, given that the, just repeating this, the mid-semester exam um, will take place on Friday, uh, September 23rd, which is your seventh week, so it's after the teaching break, uh, we moved the uh, revision lecture to the Monday of that week, which is Monday, uh, yeah. September 19th. And the next week on Friday, uh, there will be a guest lecture from uh, Tony Hosking, who will be our guest, who is the director of the School of Computing. Um, he will be talking about uh, garbage collection, or a topic of which he's an expert. Okay, this, um, just to remind us a bit that we've been talking about recursion, we, we talked about uh, recursive data structures and algorithms, and an example of these algorithms is the merge sort algorithm, which was invented by John von Neumann in 1945. Um, and the idea here is just to give you, remind you a bit what this algorithm is about. Um, this is uh, an algorithm which is used to sort um, a list of numbers, in this case they're integers, and the algorithm is recursive. As any recursive algorithm, uh, it has two main components. The base case uh, that we need in order to stop the recursion essentially, and uh, the rest of the algorithm which is its recursive component. Um, specifically, the, the merge sort algorithm um, 
the base case for the, the, the merge sort algorithm is when you have a list of size one, because of course for a list of size one, you know how to sort it, you just return that list. And then for, uh, for uh, lists which are of size larger than one, there are two main phases. The first, and they are both recursive. The first one is a split phase uh, where you um, take your list and split it uh, into two subcomponents, two sublists. We could call it the, the left list and the right list. And, um, and then uh, you have to sort each one of those sublists. And so in this process of, in the first step of splitting, we will reach at some point our base case, which are lists of size one. So here there is um, showing a bit what's happening in this uh, algorithm for this specific array, for list of numbers. And so once we reach that point, we need to start this recursive merging, which is at the same time merging and sorting back, right? So uh, taking that example, uh, let's see, we have the, the two leftmost um, lists contain 38 and 27. What we do is to compare those two numbers and then start merging, forming a sublist. And in that sublist, um, we have now 27 and 38, which are sorted. Now we keep going with that because it's a recursive algorithm. And so what, what are we going to do here? Um, is to say that we consider the two sublists, the one with 27 and 38, and the other one with 3 and 43. Then we need to start making comparisons and forming the new sublist, the new sorted sublist. So to do that, we consider the leftmost element of the first list, or the first element, I should say, of the first list, and the first element of the second list. We compare them as before. And in that case, we see that, 30, that 3 is, of course, smaller than 27. So what we do is to place 3 in the new sublist. And then uh, we have to increase uh, an index, a counter, for the elements of our right list. Okay? So now the counter for us, or the index of that keeps track of the second list, is on 43 while the index for the first list is still on 27. Then we take 27 and compare it with 43. 27 is smaller, that goes into the sublist, and we increase the index associated with the current position that we are exploring on the left list. And we keep going like that. That means that we are going to compare then uh, uh, 38 with 43, and, and then we place those appropriately in the, in the sublist. And as we merge, we get lists uh, which are of different sizes as these ones, and we keep going in the recursion iteratively, uh, uh, well, in the recursion and iteratively merging uh, those sublists. Any questions on this? No? Okay, so let's, let's go to the coding then. Um, where we are going also to implement this in a second phase of, of the coding. So, all right, so the first thing that we want to do in this uh, live coding session is to explore basic recursion and unit testing. And also a little bit just quickly to show you um, how to produce a Java doc as well, which was, I believe, one of the questions that at some point uh, was uh, posted on Piazza. Although I believe this should have been done during the, um, the lab sessions, I wanted to clarify this aspect quickly, briefly. It's very simple here in, in, in the live coding session. So let's um, start uh, creating a new package as usual. Uh, which is C01 for core component one and a new class that we are going to call maternal lineage. Maternal lineage. Uh, 
add. Now, what are we going to do in this class is essentially to have uh, just a, a class method. And the goal of this class method is to return the name of a maternal ancestor given the generation. So the generation here is going to be an integer parameter, say. And for that integer parameter, I need to return the name, a string, of that generation of ancestor. Um, so specifically, for example, if let's say the parameter is n, for n equals 1, we are going to return mother, for n equals 2, grandmother, for n equals 3, great-grandmother, and so on and so forth. Okay? So let's uh, start building just these, uh, a little bit of the interface, um, I should say the signature at this point of this method, and then of the implementation. So let's say this is a public uh, static string that we return, and we call this maternal ancestor. And we give it an integer, which is the generation, and we want to return a string. For the time being, let's say we just want to uh, 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 to have a bu the basic functionality coded up. We are going to return always mother, so that the compiler doesn't complain and lets us uh, do what we want to do. Okay, so clearly this will give the wrong result uh, for some n. Uh, which is actually what we want at this stage because we're going to do now two things the add a bit of documentation to this method and also um, um, demonstrate a bit the unit testing and test driven development on this so if you want to add documentation associated with this method all you have to do is to add this special comment here and uh, IntelliJ will immediately recognize that you're trying to give uh, the description of that method. Um, in the, on the first line, you will describe what the method is doing. Uh, so let's say maternal, oh, actually you don't need even to specify computes, the uh, a string representing the name of a maternal ancestor of a given generation. Okay, what's this parameter n? We can describe it here. This is the generation generation of the maternal ancestor. Okay, what does this return? Um, returns a string representation of the maternal ancestor. Okay, so just a few things. Of what, what, the, the first one is describing uh, in grand lines uh, what's, what's the method doing the parameters uh, that we are passing, uh, so essentially the ones in the, uh, in the method signature and uh, the return, what's, what's actually returning. Now, if we want to produce the documentation, we just need to go here, and you can see that up there, yes. Uh, you can go in tools, and um, there is this option in here, generate javadoc. This is just saying I want to generate the javadoc just for the source file generate it, um, and well, of course it will appear somewhere else, which is here. This is just an HTML, um, uh, an HTML file, uh, which will appear in your, uh, in your default browser. I can go here uh, in, on maternal lineage. Uh, this is the class, um, and in describing what's in the class, for example, uh, this maternal uh, ancestor method, and that's where the details that we entered uh, for our maternal uh, ancestor method go, um, as you can see here, what I've wrote before, okay? So that's, that's a very simple thing to do, and um, 
this is um, uh, a standard practice when you are uh, developing code in large software development projects so that uh, you can add the comment and the description of what your uh, code is actually doing. All right, so let's uh, go back to coding. Um, the other um, the other thing that I want to discuss and demonstrate immediately is test-driven development. So how do we actually do the tests here? The first thing to do is to write uh, a, a method uh, for testing, and this has to be tagged with the test tag here. Now you can see it's, it has added this, it is imported this class, which is in the uh, J unit, which is the package that we are using for, for our unit testing. Um, and once we have done that, uh, we are ready to start writing our test and essentially to, to make sure that it, that it fails for cases in which need to fail. Uh, so let's call this public void. And let's say this is going to test just our maternal ancestor uh, method. So let's call it maternal ancestor ancestor test. Now, how do we actually uh, perform the test? Uh, well, one test, the typical test that you would like to, that usually people do, right, it makes sense to do, is that you know what is the correct return um, um, value for a given method, and so you have a bunch of those return values which are the correct ones or the expected ones, and you test those against the ones that your method is actually uh, returning back. And so a good way to do that is to use assertions. Now, JUnit defines also a bunch of different assertions. What are assertions? Assertions, they are uh, essentially logical tests um, on, on, on typically on two uh, uh, input uh, parameters or variables that you give. And if, if, if they do not match um, or if, if they fail the logic test, then that will uh, throw an exception in your program uh, which will be that the assertion is failed and exit. And so these are defined in the assertions here uh, class. Uh, and um, in this case, what we want is, uh, th there, are, there is a bunch of them, as you can see, uh, whether you're comparing arrays, or strings, or whatever, uh, we want assert equals, uh, but specifically we want it for strings in this case. Uh, for example, uh, the expected String should be um, mother when we run our method, which is maternal ancestor um, with um, um, a parameter n equals one. Okay, and then we can add a bunch of additional methods here. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, of assertions based on different values of n, for example. So let's say two and three, and uh, this has to be grandmother, and this has to be great grandmother. Now we don't need a main method anymore because we can directly run the test um, as uh, there is this option here, and you can run it uh, and check whether it fails or not. And it fails, it says test uh, is fa has failed here. Let's move this here. And it, it's saying to you, okay, I, I expected a grandmother there, but you returned a mother, so we failed the test. All right, so once we have done this, uh, we make sure that the test fails uh, in the conditions in which it needs to fail. Uh, now we need to uh, actually code up uh, our, our method. Um, another important point here, what happens if uh, n is uh, less than 1, for example? We, we don't have a defined behavior, right? So, if, so we, we need to make sure 
that we catch this uh, immediately uh, at runtime if we if we pass a parameter. Uh, in this case, it's an integer which is in a, in a range where uh, our method doesn't make sense. Uh, we would like to uh, again throw an error, and in this case, you can do it with the standard assert uh, uh, method here. That what we'll do is to do a logic comparison. In this case, let's say n greater than zero. So if n is greater than zero, that the assert is, is, is positive. So that, that will assert that the, the, um, the logic um, statement will be evaluated to true. And then it will keep going. So in the, in, in the rest of the body of the method. But if it doesn't, then it will, again, throw an exception and say you failed an assertion and exit. Okay, once we have done that, um, how do we actually code up uh, this thing? So, uh, let, well, the first thing that we have uh, is a base case. Um, I would say that this is a base case, right? In recursion. Um, we do need also another base case. There are two base cases here. Uh, I, one is returning mother, the other one is returning grandmother. And then we could think of keep uh, recursively adding the great uh, dash string on top of the string that we already obtained. Okay? So any idea of how to do this? How would I implement this? How would you implement this? Yes? Yes, that is correct. So we'll, that the objective is, um, except for the base cases, right? Uh, what we need to do is to recursively call the method itself, maternal ancestor, with um, n, say, minus 1 at that point, uh, so that it will and, and concatenate the result of that uh, with a great um, dash string, with a great dash string. So we have, we, we have a, a few cases here uh, to handle. So the base case number one, the base case number two, and the recursion. How would I implement this? There are a couple of, maybe even more than a couple than option, of options here. How would you implement this logic? So this is about selection, right? Because we need to select uh, the right branch of the code based on, on the case. And you can do that by using an if statement or you can use a switch statement, for example. So let's, let's go for a, for a switch statement. What we're going to do here is to say we are going to return something which comes from the switch we switch over n, the n value, the value of n, sorry. Uh, we need a semicolon here because this is a statement. And, um, and then we need to add the cases. So let's say the base case 1, uh, or let's say actually for n equals 1, is that we simply do case 1 and return. We're using the modern uh, syntax of the switch statement. Uh, we are going to return Mamba. Okay. Uh, case two. We are going to that's that's base case as well. Uh, we are going to return grandmother. And now the actual recursion. So how do we implement this? What's the case for this? I 
again, we have just essentially three major cases, right? Base one, base two, and recursion. So if it is not base one, and if it is not base two, it has to be recursion, so we can implement this as the default case, okay? Does it make sense? And so once we do that, then what we are going to return is great, dash, and then we concatenate that string with whatever comes uh, as a return value from maternal ancestor and minus one. All right, so let's test this. Uh, we can go back here and um, and test it. And see what happens. No, nope. here. And so this passes uh, the test. Okay, does that make sense? Now, let's see, for example, if I add, uh, let's say, a case with a little bit more of recursion, something like that. Oops. Let's uh, run this just to make sure that um, it, it passes the test. So fine. Now what I would like to show you is how the code is actually behaving internally when executed. Okay, so to do that, uh, we can put the breakpoint here um, and run a debug session on this line, um, on this code actually. So debug maternal ancestor test. And we'll, that would, what that will do is to run until it reaches that line that will stop and will let us decide whether we want to uh, 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 step um, over or step within that method call. So we need to step in within the method call because we want to kind of dissect what, that, what is happening at runtime when we call these recursive uh, algorithms. So now I stepped in and it's giving me two options. I could the step in and analyze what's happening within assert equals or within maternal ancestor. I'm not really interested in the logic of assert equals. I'm interested in maternal ancestor, so I'm going to click on that. And that's starting the execution. Now we have n uh, equal four and we are asserting that. Uh, and one important thing to note now this is essentially representing our stack. We have uh, one instance of maternal, uh, maternal um, ancestor within maternal lineage, which is uh, pushed on, onto the stack, okay? And for that instance, n is equal four, and now we need to resolve this method call. So we keep going, um, and it goes into the switch. The switch will go to the default case, and the default case is going now to call Again, maternal ancestor, and now you can see that another maternal ancestor method has been pushed onto the stack. But now this has n equals three. So we keep uh, stepping in, and uh, now with n equals three, we'll still don't get a return value, so we need to resolve this call. So we have now three of these uh, uh, um, instances of this method uh, which are uh, have different parameter uh, value. And then uh, for n equal to, we finally have a return value, uh, which is grandmother. And that, that now we can resolve that method call. Um, and if we do that, uh, we go back to the return. And you can see that now the third uh, maternal ancestor method uh, has been popped from, from the stack. We resolved it, we returned the correct value, uh, and so on and so forth. So each time we are returning here and concatenating, okay? And so we keep going like this uh, until uh, we complete. And uh, uh, at this stage, we are returning great, great grandmother, and there is the assertion there. Okay, great. Um, so uh, any questions on this?
Okay. Well, let's um, let's uh, proceed here uh, because I want to do a few things today. So the second uh, recursive algorithm that I want to implement with you, well, we should do it together. Really, is merge sort. Okay. So let's create a class for doing that. New Java class. Let's do merge sort. Let's add it. And what we're going to do here is again have let's have a class uh, method that does the performs the merge sort algorithm. So we're going to call this or uh, make it public, uh, static. And what are we returning here? We're returning an array of integers. This has to be the sorted array. So int, and uh, we can call this merge sort. And what's our parameter? There is only one parameter. We are going to pass um, a list, in, in this case, an array of integers as well, uh, which is the unsorted one. Um, again, for the sake of making the compiler happy at this stage, let's say we return unsorted for the time being. Let's add some documentation here and say, what does this do? Sort uh, arrays of integer integers uh, using the merge sort algorithm unsorted on array of unsorted ints and this returns an array of sorted ints okay uh, let's also go with the test uh, immediately Once again, as before, test, uh, let's say again, public void uh, merge sort test, merge sort uh, test. And okay, now we need to um, again provide some um, uh, some expected values, well, some the input and the output, right? So the input has to be an unsorted array and the output has to be its sorted version. So let's do that. Um, unsorted, uh, it's an array of integers and it has some values in there. What are these values? Let's say five, uh, six, um, 20, uh, three, two, um, uh, 36 or actually let's do 16 uh, 42 whatever completely random uh, what did they do I didn't put new okay uh, and then we need to have the sorted version of this easy enough uh, let's go with whatever that is two three five Six, sixteen, twenty, forty-two, and this has to be sorted. Okay, and now we can write uh, our t uh, our assertion. Um, we want to assert that these two arrays are equal. So let's go back to assertions here, and this has a specific method. Uh, you can't use assert equals, so there is a, there is a specific method called this one, uh, assert array equals, and the expected is sorted, and uh, the one that we are providing has to be returned by our merge sort uh, algorithm, uh, sorry, method, uh, using the unsorted um, as, a, as a, a parameter. Let's check that this fails.
on. I don't care about this. And of course, it fails. Uh, it tells you immediately, I don't need to go to do all the values here. I'm checking the first one of the first array and the first one of the second array, and they are not matching. One is two and the other one is five. So this is not working. Okay, great. So now uh, let's get to it. Let's uh, implement merge sort. So what are the main components of the merge sort algorithm? What do I need to do here? Yes? Base case first. So let's write that. Base case. And this is when um, the array is uh, of size, let's say, 1, right? So if unsorted the length is less or equal to 1, what we are going to do is to return unsorted, right? Next, what do we do um, if that array has a size which is greater than 1? Second component of merge sort. Yes? Skip there. Right, so the second step is to recursively split, right? We need to reach the base case and then merge back, still recursively. So let's do the split. Uh, and we split this, let's say, in, in two pieces. Let's give the size of each one, the left uh, array as size L size. And let's say this is unsorted length um, divided by two. Can be another number. Um, and uh, let's say int, or I could do directly bar to prepare there, R size. I think it is also a bit clearer. Um, so what, what do I put here? How big does this size needs to be? Yes? Cool, great. So don't need to go crazy with floor or ceiling functions and so on. Just keep it simple. So unsorted dot length minus L size. Great. Okay, now we need, we need to create the two uh, arrays for, for the two, uh, that, uh, for the list that we split. So let's do that quickly. Left, um, new, and this is an array of integers, and the size of this is L size. And uh, then we have the right array and this is our size. Okay, next step, what we need to do now? We got the two subarrays. What's what's coming next here? What's in those subarrays that we just created? Yep. Okay, cool. We need to copy the data, uh, well, the, the right portion of the data from the unsorted guy to the sorted, uh, well, to these sublists for the moment. So there is a method that early on I discussed, uh, which is designed for doing a fast copy of arrays, which is called array copy. It's right here. So let we copy from the source, which is unsorted, position zero uh, to the left array starting at position zero, and we give it the number of elements here that we want to copy, which is L size. Okay, so that's one of the two. We also need to copy the other, um, say, half. And um, here, 
our positions uh, indices so are zero indexed, so start with a zero, so this is L size, not written that way though, uh, and then we copy to the right array and a position zero R size elements, okay? All right, now that we copied, what do we do now? We have the two sublists. Yes. Correct. So at this point, you know, the sublists might not be of size one. Um, so we are not even reaching the the uh, the uh, the base case, uh, nor merging back in a sorted fashion. So what we want for these two sublists uh, to to be uh, uh, sorted. So we want to have two sorted sublists, and in order to do that, the only way to do it is to go back, merge sort on them. So let's say that now. Uh, we are going to get a sorted list, uh, and let's call it le left sorted, L sorted, and uh, this we can get it by calling merge sort on the left sub list, and then the same on the right. Call it R sorted here. So, what do we have at this stage? We have two lists, which are sublists, and they are sorted. What do we need to do next here? Next stage. Remember the diagram that we had before. So if, if I have two lists and now they are finally sorted, what I need to do is to figure out, yes? Exactly, so now we finally implement the merging, which is kind of a funny term because it's not just merging, but it's merging and at the same time uh, um, sorting. Okay, so let's. that's the third step. That's the merge. All right, for the merge, as I said before, what we need to do is to iterate in a specific way through the elements of the left list and the right list, which are already sorted, and making comparisons. So for iterating through them, let's have two counters. Well, let's call them L for the left list. Starts from the beginning of the list and R for the right list, and let's uh, start from zero there. What else do we need? What are, we, what are we going to return here? What else is needed? Yes? The sorted list. So we, we just have the two pieces. We need to put them together in the sorted list. Um, and uh, so what's the size of that list? Let me write it sorted. This is a list of integers. What's the size of this list, of this array? Yes? So the original, the one, the one we passed through, we're still going through that. Uh, you know, we, we reached the point, we've done the split, but what we want is a sorted array with the, the size of the array that we passed at the beginning. So this is unsorted. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, and uh, again, I forgot new. Uh, now, uh, here, we can, we know already that we can get sorted. And so now we actually need to do uh, the process of sorting. So for the process of sorting, 
uh, what we need to do is to take one element per each element of the left array and right array and place it in the right position in the sorted array. So I can do this with a for loop. For example, that's one way of doing it. And so if I need to do this, how long must this sorted, uh, this, this, um, this for loop be? What's the termination condition here? Well, sort of broadly. Okay, cool. Let's keep increasing this guy. This uh, um, iterate. And okay, now we have a few cases, right? So let's uh, let's start with the simple ones. Let's say, for example, that. Um, what do we say that L is greater or equal to um, to L sorted dot sorted what is it dot length, which is also L size anyway. So in this case, what does this mean? First of all, what what, what happened here? So if the index cell is greater than uh, the size of L sorted, sorry, greater or equal to. Yes? Sorry, can you repeat? Right, so the left, we are off the left array. It doesn't exist anymore. So we will have to look only, the only possibility is looking into the right. So. If we are off that, let's say, let's write it um, essentially left has been emptied. Okay, in that case, what do we do? Well, we go, uh, we need to still choose an element to put in the sorted array, but the right array is sorted. So, which one do we choose? We choose the one which is at the current R position, because if we keep going in that order, in the array, the array is already sorted, that that guarantees that in the sorted array, we are going to put sorted numbers. And so this has to be R sorted at position R, and we keep advancing, right? Plus plus R, let's say. Then the other one is simple, right? So what's the the equivalent one for um, for um, for R? So we have R greater or equal to um, R sorted, uh, which is also R size. I guess I'm using a bunch of redundant uh, variables here just to you know to emphasize that this is associated with that array, that that array has been emptied. So now we look at the left one and say, okay, sorted i, uh, let's look into the uh, l sorted at position l and keep increasing l. Okay, now the typical case. What do we need to do here now? Yes? Correct. So we need to take, we L and R have some values at this stage. They correspond some indices in the two arrays. We need to take the values of those two arrays at those indices and compare it to uh, decide which one goes in this order that way. And so we do if, uh, let's say, L sorted here is less or equal to, uh, um, we need L here, 
which is the current position that we are exploring of that array, are sorted here at R. What's going to happen here? Well, L sorted is, uh, is smaller. The L sorted element is smaller, so that goes in, in sorted. And so that's L sorted, and that's L here. And we also, as before, need to advance the, 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 the position. So increase the counter L, and the other case uh, is trivial. So in any other case, sorted I equals R sorted R. And we increase R. Anything else that we need to do here? Nope. Not really. We are actually we are actually done. Okay. So let's see whether this works. Run that sort of test. I don't want this. And yes, it's all fine. Okay? So, since this is a bit of an algorithm that has a bit of a few components in there, in this method, let's go what we did before. Let's uh, put a breakpoint here. And let's run a bit through it, not all to, all to all of that, uh, but let's let's just a few a few steps in there, so we understand precisely what's the flow, uh, the logic flow of this of this algorithm. Um, so let's run in debug mode. And uh, we get to that point, we want to step in in that method and select merge sort. Okay, so now we are providing that unsorted array. This is so nice, it's giving you all the values there. And that fails uh, our assertion. First, merge sort on the stack. And we keep going, right, so we are now deciding our sizes. One is three, one is four. We copy those into our arrays. And now we we have this 5620 array. We call merge sort on it. And keep going. We do the same thing as before. Now for the first half of that, we have an array with a single number in there. So that's going to go uh, call merge sort there, but it's going to be asserted to true. So we have our first return value, which is that array with five. In the, and, and so that's returning uh, that to L sorted. Now we can finally step to the merge sort of the very first uh, right half that we had, which was this, uh, um, uh, sorry, we can step now on the previous um, um, iteration of the, 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 the right that we had. So you can see that unsorted year is 5, 6, 20. We had an array created uh, with, with 5. We had split, it, uh, uh, split that, uh, and then we are now needed, needing to deal with six, uh, the one with 6, 20 in there. So, so far we have already two of those merge sort on the stack. Keep going with this. And then we have a new left and a new right that we need to resolve, which is 20. And that's returned. And so now, finally, with those two, we can step to the, uh, into the merging case. Okay. So now this is going to be, of course, quite simple. Um, it's actually basically already sorted. And 
that returns a disordered graph. Okay? And again, we keep going that is returned on that line, so because we are finally sorted at 620, and now we can do a more interesting case where we have one array uh, which is only has only one element, which is five, and the other one which has six and twenty, and those are both sorted, and we go through this um, procedure here and keep going, and that will return this five six twenty and so on and so forth. And as we do this, uh, we keep uh, basically pushing and popping each time we push each time we call merge sort a merge sort on the stack and we pop it each time we return either from the base case or uh, reaching the bottom of that method okay any questions on this It's okay, yeah? Good. This clear is good. All right, so with the remaining time, which is a bit of pretty much almost half an hour here, um, now we are going, if there are not, no questions here, we're going to go back uh, to the slides and start to discussing collections. Okay, slides. Okay, so this, uh, this one, this unit about collections is, is a big, probably the largest one that we've done so far. Um, I don't think in, in general it's too large, but the point is that there is a lot of uh, high-level content uh, and uh, and the underpinning low-level content, so the implementation, the actual implementation uh, of these uh, collections, the classes that actually implement collections, but there's a number of them, um, mainly four are very common and of interest uh, to us, uh, and those will explore them in detail in a live uh, coding session. Okay, so uh, Java contains a framework called the Collections uh, Framework, and this is essentially takes the role of the standard library that you have been using so far, uh, but for collections. So what is, what is a collection, first of all? A collection is a class type which is used for storing objects uh, all over a given type, okay? So to a certain extent, uh, a collection, the, the, um, the concept which is most akin to a collection is an array itself. Although an array is not uh, under Java, uh, uh, implemented as a, as a collection. So what's the main difference between an array and a collection? Uh, a collections provide more flexible ways uh, to store objects and to deal with them in terms of the algorithms associated with those, um, with those objects within the collection. For example, for adding elements, uh, uh, for searching into those, uh, into those uh, collections, um, and again, adding flexibility such as, for example, arrays are uh, data structures which are of fixed, fixed size, while instead there are collections such as array list uh, which are of variable size. So they provide much more flexibility. Um, now this comes through um, three main uh, components of the collection framework. The first one is that the framework provides interfaces. Um, and so these interfaces, by definition, are a implementation agnostic interfaces for collections. Um, so these are a bunch of, of methods which are defined. And then they are uh, implemented and therefore overwritten by actual 
concrete implementations, which is the, the next uh, component. So here, th there are some classes that are not generic collections. They, uh, they have a concrete implementation, which will implement also those, uh, the, the methods in those interfaces. And a third component, uh, some algorithms, uh, which um, are extremely helpful that you can rely on when you're dealing with collections. So the idea is here is that, um, again, the, 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 the comparison, the best comparison, I think, is with the standard library. Uh, using the collection uh, framework uh, saves you a lot of time on writing your own classes, implementations. You can rely on data structures uh, which are optimized and, uh, and on algorithms uh, on those data structures or that make use of those data structures which, are, which have high performance um, and also at the same time while you are operating at the higher level of abstraction. So this reduces, uh, this increases performance, introduces less chances to uh, introduce bugs, of course, because you're operating on a higher level of abstraction and it is uh, much easier uh, to, uh, to deal with, uh, with collections rather than implementing your own classes. So the idea here is do not reinvent the wheel, really. Um, of course, as we go through these collections um, and you are encouraged to use the collection uh, data structure and concrete implementations and algorithms for the reasons that I just said, that I just mentioned, but at the same time will give also some of the details of how these collections work, especially in terms of the data structures and the associated algorithms. Um, why? Well, because you need to understand um, some of these details, for example, how they are structured and the performance of the associated algorithm in order to be able to make a choice when or when to use uh, um, a concrete implementation for a collection in a given algorithm, right? So it, it's ultimately providing you with, the, with the knowledge and tools to make a choice. Okay, the collection interface, as I said before, um, provides a bunch of methods which are quite high level and generic. Um, some of these methods are called the basic operators. Uh, for example, size will give you the size of the collection. Is empty will return a boolean that tells you whether the collection is empty or not. Uh, contains is essentially a search algorithm. You can search for a specific element in that collection and other remove are methods for adding or removing elements to that uh, to that collection. Uh, there are also in the collection interface uh, methods for um, I guess that use less boilerplate code uh, for fast uh, traversal of the collection itself. One of these is the for each method that we will uh, uh, explore in detail. Uh, Additional methods are bulk, bulk operators, uh, contains all, you give it a bunch of, of, of uh, elements that you want to check whether they are in the collection, add, remove all, retain all, clear for uh, essentially eliminating all the elements uh, in that collection. Another uh, extremely helpful uh, feature of the collection interface is that provides uh, specific methods for converting from and converting to uh, regular arrays. Okay, there are there are few. So we have this high level abstraction, which is collections. Okay, and then there is still another relatively high level of abstraction, but lower level than the the set. You know, the definition of the collection. Um, uh, framework itself and this level is that of the primary collection types so this is still abstract it's not um, uh, a concrete implementation um, but provides uh, you with a bunch of uh, if you want 
basic templates or high level templates of what a collection can be. And these are sets, lists, queues, and, and, uh, and maps. Uh, what is a set? Uh, a set is um, the idea of a set is to abstract away the concept of a mathematical set. And for that reason, uh, that doesn't allow any duplicates, right? It's a mathematical set, and it doesn't bear uh, any notion of order, okay? So no duplicates, no order in there. A list instead, uh, which is well, m m one, m one very akin concept to the list, is the array itself. But there are other kinds of lists that we'll see, like a linked list, for example, which is not an array is instead um, provides um, a, a list of ordered elements, so it has a notion, intrinsic notion of order in it. Uh, you might have or not random access to the elements in that list. Uh, that depends on the, the actual concrete implementation of that uh, list. Um, and uh, can have duplicates, okay? Q. Uh, these are typically, for example, shared work queues uh, that have uh, 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 FIFO, so first in, first out uh, kind of, uh, of access, uh, for example, like a stack. Uh, and a map, if you haven't encountered this, uh, this is going to be new, and this is actually, I find it an extremely helpful and, and cool feature of, of you know, structured programming languages. So what this is, um, is essentially um, um, a collection of key value pairs. And what, what it guarantees is that, uh, well, it provides um, a, a unique mapping between a key and the value. So that if you have a key, you, you can get, uh, or the, the map will return a specific value which corresponds to that key. So since this is the only guarantee, maps are not guaranteed to be ordered as well. So no order in there. Now, each one of the collection types, of the primary collection types, is not a class, is defined as an interface, okay? And when you need, uh, when you have a concrete uh, collection uh, type, okay, so the one which has the implementation, that is going to implement one of these interfaces. And so how do we choose uh, between uh, the concrete uh, implementation type or one of these interfaces? So one of the uh, collection types? Uh, well, typically the, 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 the number one choice is associated usually with performance. So it depends on what your implementation goal is, uh, what is uh, the outcome of your algorithm. Based on that, different collections will have different performance um, for different kinds of tasks. Uh, and so typically you would choose the one that gives you the best performance for your code. And here are uh, some of the uh, uh, concrete, uh, or, or I think the concrete com uh, collection types. So how does this table work? On the uh, leftmost column, we have the interfaces, which are the primitive collection types, which are defined through the interfaces. So we have those four that we saw before. And then we have concrete class implementations, which are classes that implement one of those interfaces, and they are implemented using some specific data structures. And these are hash tables, resizable arrays, trees, linked lists, and hash table plus linked list. Okay, so those are uh, essentially data structures. And so for a given interface and a given um, um, data structure, which is underlying the implementation, of that particular concrete um, uh, collection, uh, you can have, um, sorry, you can have a concrete um, implementation of that collection. Uh, for example, the first one, let's say uh, the set uh, uh, interface, um, for the set interface, there is a concrete implementation that uses a hash table, and that is called the hash set. For uh, the list, which is typically, the, well, this will be very much of interest for us, 
uh, we have two main um, uh, concrete uh, collections associated with, with, the, uh, with, um, with the primary collection type list, and those are the array list and the linked list. The array list is essentially the closest thing to an array, but it's resizable, and it has a bunch of additional functionalities because it's resizable. And the linked list uh, is uh, a core concept of computer science that we will discuss later on. Another one which kind of represents the typical implementation of a map uh, is the hash map. And we will, we will actually do some coding example using uh, hash map, which is a map implemented using a hash table data structure. Okay, there are, um, among the, the ones before, the, uh, the concrete implementation of collections, which implement various interfaces, um, these four are the ones which are the most commonly used, okay? As I said before, um, one is, uh, sorry, I mentioned before a hash set, this is uh, implementing a set using a hash table. Once again, since it is a set, um, this makes no guarantees uh, with the ordering of the elements within that collection, within that hash set, or within that set, and um, uh, it cannot have duplicates. Array list implements a list uh, using an array. This is designed for giving fast, very fast, random access within the array. Okay, so you can choose um, um, within the array list. Uh, you can choose any element as you have done before uh, previously by using regular arrays at, at, at a, a arbitrary location within the uh, within the list, and that should give you fast access to that element. A hash map is instead a map using a hash table, no ordering guarantees. This is a bunch of, uh, or a list, I should say, better say, I guess, a collection of um, key value pairs, uh, which is designed to give you order one, so constant time access to the value if you have a given key. Okay, so th there's also this one, very fast access. And the last one is a linked list, uh, which implements a queue in this case, uh, using the linked list data structure. As I said before, that's typical of queues. Uh, though, though there are different kinds of queues, the most common is this one, which uses a first in, first out uh, queue uh, ordering. Okay, so um, mentioned before, uh, Collections uh, implement uh, this for each method. And so this, this is a method which uh, uh, applies uh, an, a specific action to e every element in that collection. Um, basically what it does is to, um, uh, to avoid that, you will, I guess to save you the time of writing a for loop as we have in this example where thing t uh, uh, is T is an element of uh, things which might be a collection and in that case again we are writing a for loop uh, with the enhanced uh, uh, con uh, for loop construct and applying that method uh, to an each element at a time instead you can directly use the for each method there will be a method that belongs to the um, to the to the to the specific class um, of the collection of the concrete implementation of the collection that you're using, so it's defined for all of them. And the idea here is that uh, you can operate on each element uh, of uh, that collection on each element, one element at a time, but on all elements using a lambda expression. Okay, so you. Uh, the, the, the argument of for each is a lambda expression. In this case, uh, is just printing out uh, t. What's t? The parameter t is one element. It stands for a generic element of the collection that, uh, in this case, um, uh, the in instance of that collection is uh, things. 
Okay, all clear so far? All right, um, so we talked about collections so far. Uh, one typical operation uh, that we want to do on collections is ordering them. And so we need to talk about what's the notion of order associated with these, uh, with these objects. Now this is a bit um, um, slightly, I would say, convoluted. There are two main interfaces that uh, allow you to order the elements uh, of a collection. Uh, the first one is the comparable interface. This interface defines a natural ordering for um, all instances of a given type in that collection. Um, so this is a functional interface, as you can see, because uh, it has uh, only one method in there. What does that method return? Well, it will return either a negative value, zero, or a positive value if the receiver comes before, equal, or after the argument. Okay, so basically what's the receiver? The receiver is one of the elements of that collection. Okay, so you have one element of that collection, then you're using the compare to uh, method to compare it to, to another, and therefore uh, there is this notion of, and, and, and that is, in the, the comparison is performed using the natural notion of order for those for those elements. Okay, so if it is an integer, uh, smallest to largest. There is another interface, which is the comparator interface instead, which allows you to uh, define a different way of, or actually to define a your own way of ordering the elements of a collection. Okay, and so this is an interface as well. Now. They are both functional interfaces, but internally, these two are used differently. The, com the comparable interface is implemented by, um, uh, by the concrete implementation of a collection. Okay? So you have a class which is uh, implementing the interface, uh, one of the, of the uh, primitive uh, collection, primary uh, collection type interfaces, and it also implements this functional interface. So that method is going to be somewhere uh, overwritten uh, within the class to provide uh, what's the natural ordering for that particular uh, class, which is a collection. The comparator instead interface, it's more exposed. The way this the way it is used is by providing a lambda expression, and we have seen this, that matches the return type and the signature of the compare method in that functional interface. And so this will be also uh, um, a little bit clearer soon in the next slide, but repeating, the comparable interface um, is implemented um, by a class, by the class that you're using, which is a concrete implementation of one of the uh, uh, collection, uh, primitive collection types. Uh, and this provides a natural ordering. The comparator interface is a functional interface that is typically used uh, um, to provide an, a different kind of ordering. And so it, 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 it takes as argument two elements of that collection and is used typically through, uh, well, probably for all intents and purposes that you will do, by using a lambda expression. What's this lambda expression? This is going to be um, a lambda expression whose body implements an algorithm that defines the way you want to compare the elements of that collection so that you can provide the way to order them which is not the natural ordering. Now this comes down basically to this slide because all collections as I said before 
um, in the collection framework there are, uh, there, 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 are, there, is, there are interfaces defined and those interfaces one of those interfaces defines this uh, sort method which is implemented for all the um, uh, the, uh, the the practical implementations of, of collections or the concrete uh, implementation of collections and so what does sort do in reality is if you do not provide any argument is essentially using the implementation of that concrete collection type of the comparable interface, okay, um, which is implemented there. If instead you provide a lambda expression, and you do need to have two values, is actually using the uh, comparator interface and therefore, since it's using, that is a functional interface, as I said before, let's go back, the comparator interface implements, um, uh, contains the compare method, the return type is integer, the signature has two objects, which are the elements of the collection. Therefore, you need to provide a lambda expression that matches that, okay? That matches that particular uh, functional interface Okay, I hope this is clear. Last uh, slide for today. Um, okay, so Josh Block item 25. Prefer always lists to arrays. First is Josh uh, Block. Uh, he is uh, a very important software engineer who has led the design and implementation of numerous features of uh, the Java programming language. He has published uh, various um, editions, I should say, uh, of a, a very famous book uh, called Effective Java, uh, which is the Bible of the best practices uh, of in the Java programming language. And so each, each best practice is, um, is reported in the book as an item. Uh, I believe we are at around, the, in the latest version, he reaches kind of 90 of those uh, items. And item 24 is this one. Now, so why do we need to prefer lists to arrays? Do I want to just disambiguate here? Lists means um, uh, the, the primary collection type list, which is an interface. Okay, so we, whatever the list is, uh, but in practice, um, I guess if we are talking of specific array, specifically of arrays, uh, then the, the good comparison would be between one of the concrete implementation of the list interface, which is array list, okay, and the regular arrays, just to specify things a little bit more. Anyway, so the reason is that arrays are covariant, the generics are invariant, which probably at this stage doesn't mean anything to you. So to explain that a little bit more, what does that mean? So let's say that we have two types, two, uh, two classes, uh, A and B, and A extends B. Then uh, uh, an array, a, a type, a class type, array of type A becomes automatically a subclass of the type array of B okay so basically since A is uh, a child of B also array of A the type is a child of array of B so we have this um, this um, automatic inheritance relationship between the between two types and the types coming from arrays of those types Okay, so uh, instead for a list, um, as you can see, these are generics. Uh, a list of type A bears no inheritance relationship whatsoever uh, with the list of uh, type B, where B is uh, the type parameter for that uh, generic. Okay, and so this. Um, what does this mean? Well, this means that um, if you're using arrays, you could potentially cast 
let's say uh, array A, array of A to array of B. That's an upcast, right? You cannot do that with the with the list of B and list of A. And so this might seem a limitation on the um, on the generics side or, or, or on the lists in this case, but actually it's not because um, in practice this makes uh, generics and in this case lists, which are a kind of generics, um, uh, uh, more type safe than regular arrays. And so here there is uh, an example um, of um, of the kind of ugly uh, issues that can happen in runtime uh, because of this um, inheritance, intrinsic inheritance relationship of uh, arrays. So let's say that uh, uh, we have this code where um, where we have a, uh, we, what we are doing here is to have a regular array of long, okay, and we are upcasting that to uh, an array of object, which is called object array. We can do that, we don't need to, to put the cast there because this is an upcast. Uh, when does this happen? When does the upcast happen? Compiler runtime. The upcast is a, a compile time. Um, and then, let's say not. not, not uh, let's say that we, we do the second line. We are setting uh, one of the elements of that object array to a string. There is no way for the compiler to know whether the underlying, the actual underlying array, has a type, uh, which is an array of types which are compatible with strings, or better that can be assigned to a string, okay? So that check has to be done at runtime. And when it's done at runtime, it fails. And it fails because um, in practice, uh, that object array is a reference. So under the hood is nothing else than an array of long, uh, which is what is pointed out, right? Uh, pointed to um, behind the scenes by that array of object. And since that's the underlying type, you cannot set that to a string. Okay, so you cannot store a string in the alone. That's that's all happens, it's, but it knows it only at runtime. For uh, for um for a list instead, that's not possible uh, from the outset. Okay? You cannot uh, cast uh, somehow uh, a list of object, uh, sorry, an array list in this case of long to um, a list of object because these are uh, incompatible uh, uh, types and that will, that will fail immediately at compile time. So what is the benefit of this? Uh, what is the benefit of this? What's the benefit uh, of, um, uh, of this uh, lack of the inheritance relationship of lists over arrays. What do you think is the benefit here? It's very simple. Think in practical, pra practical terms. So let's say that the line object array zero equals I don't fit in is a thousand or a million lines after the uh, the upcast, right? So that means you don't know really what's what's the underlying uh, implementation of uh, that object array, or better better said, object array to which uh, type is is array of, of which type is pointing to. You're going to fa fail a runtime. So you might release your code and create a bug a runtime after you released your code. This is not possible uh, uh, if your code fails at compile time, right? It, it won't even compile. So whenever possible, 
is it is always best to rely on a static type checking, right? Rather than dynamic or runtime checking so that we know that we have a bug straight away in our code. And so that's pretty much the story about item 25. With that, I will just release uh, a mini quiz on collections and then we are finished. Okay, released. For those who has finished and for everybody else, well, keep, keep doing what you're doing with the mini quiz. I just wanted to say after the mini quiz, if you have any questions, you can ask me. Uh, but otherwise, I'll see you on Monday where we will be doing the coding sessions associated with collections.